I like to think of myself as a logical individual. It's no secret that I am the most unsilly creator on the internet. Everything I have ever covered has been serious without the slightest shred of goofiness or defiance of reason. I only surround myself with the most scientifically explainable content and I will continue to fight back against silliness for the rest of my days. That being said, every so often there comes along a series such as Sam and Max, a franchise so bizarre and unexplainable that trying to understand it just might make your brain give up and take a vacation. So let's take a break from the constraints of science and reason to evaluate this franchise. Sam and Max Freelance Police is a lot of things, but it started out as a series of comic strips by Steve Purcell. His brother Dave used to draw comics about a dog and rabbit who were a pair of detectives, but Steve thought it would be funny to finish the unfinished comics by making them bizarre and murderous parodies of their original selves. Eventually, Dave gave Steve the rights to the series as a birthday present. The comics would only take off from there. In 1988, Steve Purcell started working for LucasArts, the gaming company counterpart to Lucasfilms. The characters Sam and Max would act as testing material for the new Scum engine, but they would receive their own game in 1993. It was called Sam and Max Hit the Road. It went on to be a beloved classic in the point-and-click adventure genre, which ignited interest in the comic series and its two title characters. Sam and Max were freelance police officers that would take on unusual jobs and use unconventional means to get them done. Sam was a six-foot dog who talked in overly explanatory sentences while Max was a murderous, violence-loving lagomorph. Not necessarily a rabbit, they're very particular about that. They had a unique chemistry that wasn't often seen in fictional pairings. The writing for the series was rather bizarre with its own special take on the subject of humor. So let's take a look at the game that gave these two the big cult following they have today. This is Sam and Max Hit the Road. The game starts out with a cutscene of an evil scientist on a date, which quickly turns into a hostage situation. Hate when that happens. But Sam and Max crash through the wall in their famous DeSoto adventurer. Max beats up the evil scientist and removes his head, but it turns out he's just a robot. So don't worry, it's still appropriate. With the mission resolved, they leave the girl there and drive away. She's probably gonna starve there, but at least they resolve the immediate issue. While this cutscene isn't entirely relevant to the story, it does a great job of introducing our main characters and what their personalities entail. Shall I confront, subdue, and pummel the suspected perpetrator, Sam? Sick him up, little buddy. It also introduces the DeSoto, which is essentially the third main character. In every form of Sam and Max media, they do pretty much everything in that car. After a long intro sequence, Sam and Max return to their office and the guy's head starts ticking. We then get a little taste of the sadistic humor in this series. Sam, either termites are burrowing through my skull, or one of us is ticking. Oops. Oh yeah. Max, where should I put this so it doesn't hurt anyone we know or care about? Out the window, Sam. There's nothing but strangers out there. When the phone rings, Sam and Max battle each other to answer it first, which was a running joke throughout the series. The unseen recurring character, the Commissioner, calls to tell the freelance police that they have a new job and they must speak to a courier outside. You then take control of Sam and learn the many different controls you'll need to get a handle on if you want to get through this adventure. On your first run, the controls might seem confusing, but you get the hang of them after a while. You have six different options for how you can interact with people or objects in the game. The finger icon tells Sam to walk somewhere, the fist tells him to pick something up, the mouth tells him to talk to someone, the eye will give you his analysis on something, and this weird green microphone contraption thing will cause him to use something. I have no idea what that is. You can also select Max to use him on something. He's the most lethal tool in your arsenal. Sometimes it can be confusing to figure out which command you need to use, but again, you get the hang of it. It also took me far too long to realize I could just right-click to cycle through the objects. So right out of the gate, you can explore the office and see all the things there are to see. This is actually a great starting point, because it gives you a ton of interactable objects you can test the controls on. You can find a few items you can use later, but you can also talk to Max and see what his opinions on the situation are. You can do this at any point throughout the game. By now, it's easy to tell that you are in for one expansive adventure. There is already so much to do and so much to take in. LucasArts didn't pull any punches when they made this. You already know things are about to get really intense. Really silly, too. I'm filled with disgust and an odd sense of foreboding. And?
When you head outside, you get a cutscene of Sam and Max's neighbor, Flint Paper, taking out someone who got on his bad side. He's supposed to be this super cool action hero, and he's a regular character in most Sam and Max media. He doesn't really contribute to this game, but it's still nice to see him. I really respect his business acumen. Don't use the word acumen again. Outside, you meet the courier, who's actually this strange little cat who ate the commissioner's orders. Using Max, you can pull them out of the cat and get going on your merry way. You can also explore the town and stop a robbery in Bosco's convenience store, but your destination is the world-famous DeSoto. From here, you have a choice of three places you can go on this map of the United States. You can play a confusing game where you're Max riding on top of the DeSoto while overhead signs slam into you, but nothing really tells you how it works. I kept beating the stages while not really doing anything. You can also go to a gas station called Snucky's, a parody of Stucky's, and this is actually a pretty essential spot in this game. Here, you can buy one of three minigames to play. The first one is a battleship parody called Car Bomb, where you're Sam facing off against Max. It's basically just battleship, but it's still kind of addicting. Another one is a coloring game, also kind of fun. The last one is a dress-up game, but this one's interesting because it was actually a means of copy protection in the early floppy disk versions of the game. In case you're wondering what that means, copy protection was a method game designers would include to prevent a game from being illegally reproduced. Some developers found their own ways to get creative with these. Sometimes players would have to type in a certain word or something to prove they had the original version of the game. But in this case, you would have to dress up Sam and Max in some silly, unique way. There isn't a limit to how much you can put on them, so you can just dress them up with absolutely everything. So back to the game. Sometimes Max will have to go to the bathroom when you go to Snucky's, and he will repeatedly announce it to the entire world until you ask to use the restroom. The soda jerk will give you a key with a rasp attached to it, then you get this challenge where you have to stop Max before he returns from the bathroom so you can convince him to keep the rasp. You only have a short amount of time to do it, so you better not mess around. I actually had a really hard time when I first got to this, mostly because I have really slow fingers. Now back to the story. The Commissioner's orders send you to a carnival, and it's here you meet your main antagonist. This country singer slash hunter named Conroy Bumpus and his bodyguard Lee Harvey are looking for someone, but you don't know who yet. Instead of worrying about him, you want to talk to the twins who run the carnival. They tell you how their main attraction, Bruno the Bigfoot, has disappeared along with another attraction called Trixie the Giraffe-Necked Girl. Now you have to find them. When you explore the carnival, you can play games such as Whack-A-Rat, which is fun because you can hit Max with your hammer for no reason. You can also ride the Cone of Tragedy, but it causes you to lose everything in your inventory. It's part of the story, don't worry. The next really big puzzle comes when you decide to ride the Tunnel of Love. As we all know, Sam and Max are a happily married couple, so it only makes sense that they'd ride the Tunnel of Love together. But that's not the real reason you're there. For this puzzle, you have to shine a flashlight in the dark and try to illuminate an electric box. Then you have to be lightning quick and switch your inventory to Max so you can use him on the box to stop the ride. I will admit, this took me an awful lot of tries. I couldn't figure out how to keep the flashlight on while I took the time to switch to Max. I eventually did it after trying a bunch of times, but I'm not really sure how I got it to work. Once the ride stops, you find a secret hideaway where Doug the Mole Man lives. He tells you to talk to his uncle Shavul about Bruno, but he does tell you that Trixie had fallen in love with Bruno and likely ran away with him. From here, your investigation leads you to a couple different places. The first is the World of Fish, where a fisherman catches fish for a net that is then taken to the world's largest ball of twine diner by a helicopter. When you head to the world's largest ball of twine, you can ride the tram to reach the diner at the very top of it. The controls to get on the tram can feel a little weird, but it's still a nice feature. It was around this time that I realized you can mess with the settings and turn everything black and white, in case you want a really noir aesthetic. It's a really cool feature if you want to switch up how you play. You can also turn on settings that tell you what the stuff in your inventory is. Anyway, so you head back to the world of fish and climb inside this giant fake one. This decision costs the life of the fisherman, but it allows you to be thrown into the net with the other fish and carried off to the giant ball of twine. Only in this game would that sentence ever make sense. When you head to the Gator Golf Course, you reunite with Bumpus and Lee Harvey. They're looking for a Bigfoot, or a Yeti, but Sam and Max start a fight with them solely because Max can't keep his mouth shut. 
During the fight, Max is thrown into a dunk tank, and this brings us to another puzzle. The water is infested with gators, but by replacing the bucket of golf balls with a bucket of fish you got from the world of fish, you're able to summon a bunch of gators to swim in perfect bridge formation so you can walk across them to reach the dunk tank. You can also just dunk Max by hitting the target. It's funny. The gators can seem like they move in unpredictable directions, but it isn't too hard of a puzzle. Just trial and error. It's really clever, though. Once you reach Max, you get a hilarious cutscene where our two heroes argue. Did I mention what a lousy golfer you were? You suck, Sam. You find a snow globe addressed to a Bigfoot from Shavul. It came from a strange place called the Mystery Vortex. Before you can go there, however, it's of the absolute necessity that you go to the Ball of Twine and combine a severed hand with a broken golf ball retriever and a magnet shaped like a fish. You then use it to reach into the Ball of Twine and recover a lost ring. I'm not joking, that's what you gotta do. And people gave the Trapped series a hard time for the part where you had to make a fishing pole out of a rope, a knife, and a bandana. This is just point-and-click adventure game logic, people. Not to mention physically improbable. So the Mystery Vortex is this gift shop sort of place where reality doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Even less than it usually does in this universe. Things are floating, you change size from small to large, the doors are all various sizes, this room is upside down, and you can go inside this mirror to see a room filled with magnets. Your next puzzle requires you to flip switches to turn a magnet a certain color, then you have to go through a door that's the same color. You do this until you enter the right one, which is randomly generated. I'll admit it's kinda tough to figure out, but it sure is rewarding when you do. When you enter the right door, you meet Shavul and give him back his missing ring. Oh yeah, I forgot he's supposed to be a bunny or something. It's very rare you see these guys acting like the actual animals they're supposed to be. Shavul tells you you need to go somewhere called Frog Rock, then the answer will come to you when you smear mole man powder on the rock along with three different samples of Bigfoot fur. Again, only in Sam and Max. To find Frog Rock, you go to the restaurant on top of the giant ball of twine, then you mess with some electric cables to control the binoculars. Now here's where things get interesting. When you use the binoculars, they spin around at lightning speed and you likely don't know what you're supposed to do next. Only after messing around did I realize I could control the way they moved by clicking the left or right mouse button to move in each direction. Made it so much easier. You have to listen to the instructions Shavul gave you because they can differ from game to game. Following these directions, you should be able to locate Frog Rock. When you head to Frog Rock and perform the ritual, it gets dark, then a Mole Man spaceship arrives and leaves you a message in the stars that says, Go to Bumpusville. Imagine just being an average person and seeing this appear in the sky. Bumpusville is actually where Conroy Bumpus lives, so you have to head inside his mansion. His mansion looks like the house of every celebrity ever, but he has the coolest monster truck bed. You have to steal his pillow, but the game doesn't tell you why yet. No cozy sleep for him, I guess. You also have to read this book on how to control robots, which I kid you not, takes Sam 15 hours to read. How did Conroy Bumpus not notice the six-foot dog reading in his bedroom for all that time? Then you get a fairly easy puzzle, where you rewire a cleaning robot just by unplugging everything, then you activate an alarm. This causes Lee Harvey to leave his post and check it out, allowing you to investigate the back room. Here, you find a virtual reality device and you can enter a video game. A different video game, I mean. Hey, Sam looks pretty good in polygons. It's a shame the virtual reality section of this game isn't longer. You just stab a dragon with a sword and steal its heart, which turns out to be a key in the real world. Max is also your sword. He really is just a weapon, all things considered. Lee Harvey then comes back and tells you to leave, so he just takes your word for it and lets you walk out. But if you go in this other room, you can find a portrait of John Muir. What's that? You don't know who John Muir is? Well, I'll just let the dead animal heads explain it for you. Do you really want to know? If you'll stop talking, sure. Okay. Hit it, boys. There once was a man named John Muir. A naturalist, noble and pure. His love for all beasties. The most and the leasties. Has never been equaled. Uh... For sure! Still a better edutainment game than Jumpstart Mission EarthQuest. When you head further in the mansion, Conroy Bumpus gets ready to give you a private show with none other than Bruno and Trixie performing behind him. You then get your first ever musical number in Sam and Max history. These would be common throughout the games made by Telltale. I think everything is always made better by a random musical number. You can never go wrong with those. 
Once it's over, Bumpus just leaves, so I guess he's fine with you just wandering around his house unsupervised. Using the key, you help Trixie and Bruno escape, but they don't want to go back to the circus. Actually, Bruno's been invited to a party consisting entirely of Bigfoots. He tells you how to get there, but you can't get in because you're not a Bigfoot. However, you can speak to the celebrity Evelyn Morris and get pamphlets for the Mount Rushmore Dinosaur Tar Pit and the Celebrity Vegetable Museum. Again, those are two locations that could only feasibly exist in Sam and Max. Imagine the look someone would give you if you told them you went to the Mount Rushmore Dinosaur Tar Pit. At the Celebrity Vegetable Museum, you can hand over the portrait of John Muir to have his likeness be rendered into an eggplant. Can't believe I just said that. Then you can head to the Mount Rushmore Dinosaur Tar Pit. Also can't believe that exists. You can have Max shave a mammoth statue, then you have to solve another timing-based obstacle. But this one wasn't as hard for me as the ones before it. You have to get a robot dinosaur talking, then you throw a coil of rope into its mouth while it's open. You then bring the other end to your car door and slam it shut to pull the dino's tooth out. Okay, that's it for me. That's just too silly. I can handle the severed hand golf ball retriever fish magnet combination, but that? That's just too much. How do they come up with stuff like this? Though speaking of that device, you can go bungee jumping into a pool of tar so you can fill a cup with it. Then you attach that cup to the severed hand while it's attached to the broken golf ball or two. Yeah, this is too silly. How is a serious and logical person like myself supposed to survive this dive into absurdity? After retrieving a toupee from Bumbus's house, oh, so now he wants you out of the house. You can then go to the Bigfoot party and craft a disguise out of mammoth fur, along with the toupee, tar, and some old clothes. It's the perfect Sasquatch disguise to fool the guard. Hey, that's a downright nice Sasquatch costume. I'll let you guys in with that one. Okay, that's actually really hilarious. These writers were on a whole different level of humor than the rest of us. Inside the party room, the Bigfoot leader gives an extremely long speech, then you can freely explore. When you go in the kitchen, Bumpus and Lee Harvey show up, believing you're a real Bigfoot, but you show them who you really are by taking off your disguise. The bad guys decide they're going to infiltrate the Bigfoot ranks by putting on your disguise, so they go into the freezer to change. Using Max, you can shut them in and freeze them solid. This marks the end for our enemy Bigfoot hunters. The Bigfoot Elder then shows up to thank you for helping them, declaring you worthy of Sasquatch gratitude. He then takes you out back to let you in on a little secret. Four totem poles sit by a pool, and the Yeti believe they hold the solution to the salvation of their species. The Yeti way of life is going down the tube, and the species is facing extinction. They believe the totem poles can save them, but they don't know what they mean. It then falls on you to interpret the images on the totem poles to figure out what they're trying to say. You have to throw four different objects into a pool as a sacrifice. Three of them include the pillow, the eggplant John Muir, and the dinosaur tooth. However, there's still one left. So remember that snow globe we got earlier? So you take that to the mystery vortex, open the hole in the bottom of it, climb inside the gift shop's mini vortex machine, then collect some of the vortex in the snow globe before corking it off. What? What do you mean you're confused? Makes perfect sense to me. Once you've made your four offerings, it still isn't enough, because a Bigfoot is required to make the ultimate sacrifice for it to work. This gives Max a great idea, so he heads to the freezer and takes out the frozen block that contains the disguised Bumpus and Lee Harvey. He pushes the ice block into the pool and the sacrifice is accepted. This causes a ton of trees to sprout up everywhere all over the United States, causing unspeakable collateral damage but providing salvation for the Sasquatch. Bruno and Trixie run off to Vegas to get married while the Sasquatch leader rewards Sam and Max for their help. Luckily for them, the sacrifices weren't completely destroyed in the ceremony, so they bring their still-frozen bodies back to the circus in place of Bruno, ultimately completing their mission. As the credits roll, you can play this cute minigame where you shoot targets with Sam and Max. Some of the targets are silhouettes of licensed characters. And that brings us to the end of Sam and Max Hit the Road. So, overall... That was fantastic. Sam and Max Hit the Road is often cited as one of the greatest point-and-click adventure games of all time, and I totally get it. The game is so much fun, the humor is amazing, and the characters really grow on you. The developers had to be extremely creative to come up with some of the stuff in this. Silly as it is, I highly appreciate the amount of imagination it took to create something like this. It also just has this warm feel that makes you feel good whenever you play it. It's just a nice little friendly game that makes you feel at home. Some instances can be hard, especially on your first try, but they're easily forgivable because everything in this game just works together so well. 
Sam and Max Hit the Road will always remain one of the great classic PC games and an amazing contribution to the franchise as a whole. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.